sumamente importante. Last year, the presidents of Puerto Rico's three status-based political parties asked the federal government to authorize a referendum on their island's political status and commit to act acting afterwards on implementing a status that won majority support in the referendum. Their request was endorsed by President Bush, who strongly supports statehood for the island. Chairman Ron De Lugo of this subcommittee, which has primary responsibility in the House, and Chairman Bennett Johnson of the primary Senate committee also both agreed with the proposal. Chairman Johnston developed a schedule of having the Senate act first on it to minimize confusion with the House acting afterwards. The schedule called for Senate action by last fall. The Senate committee did approve a bill last summer, but the bill generated concerns in both the Senate and the House, and the full Senate hasn't acted onto it this day. So, so this subcommittee began working last fall on concerns that could prevent the goal of self-determination from being realized. Last month, Chairman De Lugo and subcommittee ranking Republican Robert Lagomarsino introduced an alternative bill with the support of Puerto Rico's three parties, Speaker Tom Foley and Minority Leader, Leader Bob Michael. They were joined in sponsoring it by a majority of the subcommittee, including Puerto Rico's resident commissioner, Jaime Fuster, Interior and Insular Affairs Committee Chairman Mo Udall, and Ranking Republican John Young, Rules Committee Chairman Joe Moakley, and Ranking Republican Jimmy Quillen. The Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act would authorize a referendum in 1991 between enhancing Puerto Rico's current Commonwealth relationship with the U.S., statehood, and independence, and commit the Congress to act in early 1992 on legislation to implement a status that won the referendum. The implementing bill would only take effect if approved in a second referendum in 1992 to ensure that the people affected have the last word. Even before introducing this bill, Chairman De Lugo recognized that there was a good question about who the people of Puerto Rico were who should exercise self-determination. Were they only the 3.4 million people on the island or did they include the 2.5 million Puerto Ricans elsewhere, many of whom only left because of the island situation? Uh, Mr. Manuel del Valle, do you wish to make a statement? Uh, yes, I do. Please proceed. I've submitted a thesis which I drafted at the London School of Economics when I was studying there, which is a synthesis of all the Supreme Court jurisprudence on Puerto Rico. We have it for the record. It will be made a part of this hearing. Yeah, I've also submitted an article that I wrote on the question of plebiscite. My name is Manuel del Valle. I've spent approximately 18 years teaching on the legal history and politics of Puerto Rico at Fordham, Princeton, and Yale universities. Um, I raise the following questions as questions that any committee should address. One, what is the legal status of Puerto Rico within the American constitutional framework? Answer, an unincorporated territory of the United States. What does it mean to be an unincorporated territory of the United States? What are the disabilities and unequal treatment that flows from Puerto Rico's juridical status? How has Congress addressed these disabilities? What do specific congressional bilingual legislation in the area of voting rights have to do with the rights of Puerto Ricans? Does Congress have the power to define who will vote in a plebiscite? Is the plebiscite binding upon Congress? Does the plebiscite comport with the current trends to plebiscite throughout the world with the definition of peoplehood? I note that United, General, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 637, uh, passed in 1952, says that the desires of people to self-determination are to be ascertained by plebiscites or other recognized means. And the current legislation seeks to do that in conformance with that principle. I note also the uh, opinion from the Permanent Court of International Justice Advisory opinion on the Greco-Bulgarian uh, Greco communities, 
is applicable here. There, the court sought to define who or what is a people. The Permanent Court of International Justice stated, and I quote, a group of persons having a race, religion, language, and traditions of their own, and united by this identity of race, religion, language, and traditions in a sentiment of solidarity with a view to preserving their traditions, maintaining their form of worship, ensuring the instruction and upbringing of their children in accordance with the spirit and traditions of their race, and rendering mutual assistance to each other. Puerto Ricans, both in the States and on the island, form and compose part of that same definition. In terms of the question before you, what is a people? And do Puerto Ricans as the people have special rights? And does Congress have a special obligation in regards to that? Let us note that Congress presently faces no different question than does the Soviet Parliament. Note that Gorbachev's exceptions to Lithuania is that Lithuania's parliament refused to conduct a plebiscite and consult the people. Note also that the issue of peoplehood will occur in Estonia, where 50% of the population is Russian and not Estonian. The question of plebiscite and the question of peoplehood are common. Note that the question of whether a second or third or fourth generation Puerto Rican should or should not vote is answered by the reality of situation and context. You will not ask a Palestinian child born second, third, or fourth, or sixth generations removed from Palestine whether on a date in the future when a plebiscite is held, whether they should participate. Nor shall you ask a Russian Jew who has never seen Israel whether because they are 10 generations removed, they somehow lose their rights as Jews or members of the Jewish state. <laughs> Puerto Ricans are no different and they march in the same world trend. Oh. I invite you to explore the questions that I presented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor. <laughs> Councilman Rivera, uh, you know the, uh, the ground rules. Uh, please proceed. Uh, five minutes. Your full statement will be inserted in the record. You're most welcome. Thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Richardson. Uh, yeah. Please pull the microphone, uh, the, the larger one. I think I, we're having some difficulty. Thank you, Councilman. I do note uh, I'm aware of, of the gr some of the ground rules. Uh, I'm also aware that it has taken us, the committee pro participation, some 16 long hard months of struggle uh, to be recognized that we have a right as Puerto Ricans and to be consulted and to have hearings right here where over one million Puerto Ricans reside in the United States. So while I will bear with this committee, I, I hope this committee bears with me. First of all, let me congratulate each and every one of you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, for bringing this uh, committee before the people, uh, not just the over one million Puerto Ricans, but before the entire uh, people that should be knowing what is taking place in an island some 1,500 miles away from New York and, uh, and, from, and from the United States. <coughs> I would like to thank this committee, as I was uh, just indicated, for giving me this opportunity to let the world know the Puerto Ricans that live in the United States have never and will never be anything else but Puerto Ricans first. And that we claim the right to be counted as Puerto Ricans whenever a decision regarding the final political destiny of our motherland is a state. The status of Puerto Rico as a colony and the procrastination of Puerto Rico's definite political status is one of the main reasons why we are here and what makes our migration to this country different from any other. But there are other reasons as well. Let me get it out of my chest, ladies. Do you have any questions? I don't. The chair recognizes the resident commissioner, Jaime Fuster. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of uh, the president of the Board of the Bronx, uh, the Honorable Fernando Ferrer. And uh, the reason I, I've chosen you is that I guess you have the broadest uh, administrative experience uh, of all of the panelists we have heard so far. And uh, your particular judgments might be very crucial. Let me uh, uh, 
preface my statements by, by saying that right now in, in trying to ask you a question, I, I, uh, a phrase come to my, my mind about how fools rush into things that saints don't dare enter. Um, because I, maybe I shouldn't be asking the question I am, but I, I feel in honesty that I must. You know, I share with most of you the feeling that we are only one, one people, un solo pueblo. And I go as far as to extend that, not only to those born in Puerto Rico, but people like yourself that were born in New York. As I said in my statement, anybody who, who feels that Puerto Rico is nuestra patria, belongs to the same nationality I belong to, the same cultural nationality. And we surely have a legitimate claim and stake on, on deciding what's going to happen in Puerto Rico. So I, I, I totally reject the notion that people, just because they live in the mainland, but who are in every essential regard of Puerto Rican, do not have an equal stake. I, do, I think they do. But you know, the problem is that having said all of that, and, I, and I'm telling you that from my heart, you know, that's the way I feel. But having said that, I would be uh, a fool if I did not also tell you that this is an issue that in Congress, at least the people I've been talking to, is very complex. Most of the senior members and members of the leadership I've talked to in, on the Hill on this issue look at me very perplexed. Some would wish this issue would go away, and some down route tell you, you know, there's no way we can do this. And that's a reality, and I think that people here ought to know that that's the reality, at least as I have perceived it on the Hill. And it is not because there is a, a, a lack of goodwill towards mainland Puerto Ricans is that people really don't understand how it can be achieved. So this is my question, and, and I agree with you that logistics are kind of excuse if we're talking about a, a natural and a constitutional right of people, but that still does not solve the problem of trying to think out, think through carefully, how will the whole system be set up? Now, you have been involved in the very difficult task of getting Puerto Ricans to vote here in New York. Uh, you've been a, a, a one of the top guys in the leadership in, in this community. Remember that we're talking not only about Puerto Ricans in New York, but Puerto Ricans in 50 states, because Congress must, in creating a right, create it uniformly. Do you have any concrete recommendations for us as to how we can go about setting up a machinery that will be effective? And by effective, I mean you cannot simply give the right because, uh, as you will know, if the right doesn't have enough procedural guarantees, it can be challenged constitutionally as not being a, 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 an adequate mechanism. So could you give us some recommendations about this problem? Well, Congressman, I appreciate the question. While it is fair to observe that, uh, uh, that matters such as this are deeply complex um, and require great effort to administer appropriately and properly, it's also fair, I think, to point out, as uh, you had in the preamble to your question, uh, Congressman, that uh, uh, in fact, uh, no right should be limited by uh, the degree of administrative inconvenience it might cause. Uh, first, a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of facts. Uh, number one, it seems to me that while determining eligibility, it's also fair to point out that uh, we're determining merely a pool of people who will be eligible. We're not specifying who will actually vote. Those who will actually avail themselves of the right of participation in this plebiscite might well be far below the number of, uh, of those who are eligible. Second, uh, in terms of those who might prove their own eligibility by virtue of production of a birth certificate, um, uh, I appreciate especially your comment about fools and saints because uh, sometimes uh, it is fair to say uh, in our system and in other systems, fools do indeed uh, manage uh, uh, birth records uh, because it is difficult in this city and is difficult in many other cities, as you are aware, Congressman, to get one's uh, birth record uh, promptly. Uh, but that does not mean it cannot be done. It does not mean it cannot be done with dispatch, and it does not mean that it should not be done in order to uh, determine and ascertain eligibility. Are there any uh, further questions from uh, members of the panel? The chair uh, 
I, I would like to, uh, I think, I also believe, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Mr. Foster's uh, question is a uh, uh, very interesting one, and if I may be allowed just a split second, I understand that as it is now, the Congress consider eligible voters in the plebiscite all those who are eligible to vote in local election in Puerto Rico. That means that every North American and every non-Puerto Rican who has been a resident of our island with only 50 days of residency will have the right to decide the political status of Puerto Rico. Statistics reveal the number of foreign voters to be close to 100,000 votes in an island when we know here in the United States, as you know in Puerto Rico, where 50,000 votes decide the election. You tell me, Mr. Foster, if that is fair play. And in answering your question, And in answering your question, I will recall the late Freddie Prince in his program, Cheek on the Man, used to say, it's not my job, man. You know what I mean? This is the problem of the United States. The the Thank you very much, Counselor. That was a very eloquent statement. Uh